Good morning. What a great day. What a great group of people for introductions this morning. What I'd really like for you to do is turn around to the folks next to you and introduce yourself and welcome those people that you can shake hands with to the conference. <coughs> That is a much more personal and warm big set of introductions. Uh, it's very clear in discussions among uh, tribal units in Africa, it certainly is among Native Americans, and that is that if you can see the problem, you can solve it. And so in most conferences, the discussion starts in, in those settings. Discussion starts with, in the beginning, there was a creation story. And then that story will go all along, and I've actually been in conferences in Africa where we could spend two or three days getting to where we are today, understanding the problem. We don't have two or three days, and we probably will not go back to the beginning of the creation story and compare all of those thoughts. But it is critical to see the problem, but it's not enough to see the problem. And so one of the pleas that I have for you today and a challenge to you is that we get past describing the problems. We're very good at that. We've been doing that in conferences for years. We have multiple publications. We have new updates almost weekly in Nature and Science and all of these journals about what the nature of the problem is. I hope we are finally, as a community, reaching a threshold that lets us come to agreement quickly on the problems that we're talking about incredibly important to see it clearly, but then go on to, so what? What do we do about it? What are those next steps that we have to take? We don't have, I would submit to you, a food system problem. We don't have a climate problem. We do not have a problem of human rights. We do not have a problem of international stability. We do not have an economic problem we have a problem, a capital P, problem. And it comes from the way that humans have organized themselves to occupy and manipulate and exploit their habitat. It is fundamentally a problem of human ecology. As you're considering the things that you talk about today, and as you get to the point where you can see the problem, from my perspective, I would like to suggest two questions that I find particularly relevant, and you may as well. Once you see the problem, ask if it can be solved without major changes in the modern corporation, and without major and fundamental changes in the way we view sovereignty of nation states. When you start looking at those solutions, the things that you can do, and you take them down several uh, orders of consequence, there are some basic and fundamental issues in how we produce and consume which are aided, abetted, perhaps created, there'll be different points of view on that, 
by the major organizations which we have created in order to provide for our own security and for a predictable and manageable economy and meaningful lives and for benefits from a wide range. And it comes back, in my mind, to these two areas. How have we corporatized our existence on this planet and how we have nationalized our existence on this planet and whether those two forms of institutions as currently configured can lead us into a future that is materially different from the one that we experience today. And so that I'm not accused of only encouraging you to come to solutions, but falling short of that myself, let me suggest only in one of those areas because my time is short. Two things we ought to do with the modern corporation. I think you'll find it commonsensical. The first is a corporation is not a person. A corporation is not a person. It is not protected under the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. A corporation does not have freedom of speech. Individuals do, but in our system of law, one that has permeated much of the legal systems of the world, what we have done is create from a footnote in one case in California, a legal theory that says a corporation, a body created by the public, through a contract, that's what a corporation is, then becomes an individual with all of the rights of individuals. Simple change in legislation, not simple to accomplish, <laughs> would go right at that very fundamental difference and say, wait a minute, there are differences. If an individual breaks the law, an individual can be held accountable. What happens when a corporation breaks the law? No one is held accountable. The individuals disappear in the corporation. And so we have created this incredible legal fiction that says corporations are individuals, the impact of which is to shield individuals from individual responsibility. Let's change that. Let's change it. Let's stop that process. Let's make this a major issue. It will affect food systems. It will also affect other areas. Secondly, when we form a corporation, let's ask them to be explicit about the public purpose of that corporation. It's required now. Have you ever seen incorporation papers of a, of a corporation? It's required. They're supposed to say why it is that the public gives them the right to exist and practice their business. Let's ask for more detail in that statement of public purpose. And let's ask that at a minimum corporations agree to look ahead at the impact of their actions on the natural and social environment not to guarantee a certain kind of outcome, but to at least agree that they ought to weigh those consequences because they exist as public corporations. And then let's take one more step. And let's make that contract enforceable in the courts. Not only through a regulatory body, but so that citizens can say to corporations, you promised that you would do this when we gave you the right to become a corporation and do business, a right that only the people can grant <clears throat> through their government, a right which is necessary to the ability of the corporation to make profits and do all of those wonderful things that corporations do. So let's find a way to hold the individuals involved accountable for keeping their promises 
which are inherent in the purpose for setting them up. In short, this is not something new. This is something old that I'm suggesting. This is why we started setting up corporations in the first place. This is why we ask those questions of corporations when we started recognizing that there was a legal form here which could have tremendous benefit to society, which could have tremendous benefit to individuals, which could foster innovation. But what we've done is let that side go free and not looked at any of those other checks and balances. So without belaboring this because my time is short, as you see the problem today, ask yourself what are the major fundamental impediments to solving that problem? And which of those impediments are common to some of the other problems that we talk about from climate to human rights? And if we can identify some fundamental steps that we can take at a local level, at a national level, at an international level, then we will have moved beyond that threshold of most conferences, which do a great job of articulating the problem, of seeing the problem, and then we all walk away wishing that someone had suggested or that we had developed as a community some practical action steps. Food for thought, time for action. Welcome to this conference. Let's have a lot of fun today. I look forward to engaging with you on these thoughts all day long to learning from you. And now I have to turn to my real purpose for being up here, which is to introduce Natalie Springle, who is the moderator of the first panel. Natalie is, I would be remiss if I did not say, a College of the Atlantic graduate. You will see a few of those sprinkled through uh, the agenda today, not because they're College of the Atlantic graduates, but because of their accomplishments, because of what they bring to seeing and, uh, the problem and identifying the solutions. Natalie and, and her partner, Rich McDonald, have an additional credential that uh, many of you would you are, are probably unaware of, but you will recognize it very quickly, and that is that they are Garrison Keillor's naturalists. And so if you listen to Prairie Home Companion from time to time, or if you go on any of the tours that Garrison does from time to time, you will find that the teachers that he relies on both for himself and for those who participate in Prairie Home Companion are Natalie Springle and Rich McDonald. Please welcome Natalie. Hi, everyone. Um, if I could ask my four panelists to come up so that we can get you guys settled in while we do a few introductions, that would be great. Um, <laughs> as these guys are coming up to get settled in up here at the panel, and looks like Heather's gonna move the cart, that's great, thanks. Um, I thought I'd try to help us get a sense of who's here today, and first I just wanna say welcome to Maine. You're in a beautiful place if you've never been here before. Welcome to Mount Desert Island, and welcome most importantly to College of the Atlantic, where the kinds of ideas that we're gonna be talking about all day today are part of our lives every day here on this campus, so it's a really great honor for College of the Atlantic to be able to host this conference, so thanks for coming from everywhere that you do come from. Which is my question, where do we come from? There's about 20 or so people up there, just so you guys know who are down here. There's a whole nother world up on top who's involved in this conference. Um, so what I'd like to do, I can't really see you, but you guys can kind of see each other. Let's do the show of hands game. How many people in this room are part of the College of the Atlantic community? In some way, you either go to school here, or you're an alum, or you teach here. Somehow you're connected to this community. Great, that looks like probably a third or so, I would say. Um, how many people are from Maine? And you can raise your hands more than one time for this quiz here. <laughs> Great, um, about the same number, but not all the same people. How many people are from the US? Okay, now we're starting to look at big numbers. And how many people are from outside of the United States? Great, 
a heartfelt welcome to folks who are from not the US. Um, it's really great to have you guys come all the way over here from wh wherever it is that you're from. And I know we'll have the chance to learn through the course of the day everybody's story, which is probably the best part of the day for me. Um, before I jump into the honor of introducing our first morning plenary, I just want to give you a little tiny anecdote. Um, about three or so years ago, I can't remember exactly when, um, my family and I um, joined a community-supported agricultural program here on Mount Desert Island. And this was before my two-and-a-half-year-old daughter was born. Um, and so on a weekly basis for about five months of the year, we get our box of really wonderful fresh vegetables um, and fruit, mostly vegetables, and some eggs and other things that we can choose. Um, and this has been part of our routine for the last three years. And then about a year and a half ago, we joined the new community-supported fishery, um, which has been totally exciting. Um, I'm from the University of Maine Sea Grant program with an office here at COA, and my work area focuses in marine and coastal um, issues and sustainability related to those areas. So being able to tap into a community-supported fishery for me was particularly exciting both professionally and personally. Um, and right from the get-go, my little girl was about one and a half years old and she got right in there and learned how to shuck shrimp with us and gut the fish and she gets the fish all over herself and she thinks it's the coolest thing on the planet. And what makes me really excited is that this little girl who you might see running around today, she's the very short one with lots of blonde hair and dressed all in purple every day. Um, <laughs> She thinks this is normal. She thinks that this is the way that we get our food, that we get our food from directly from the farmer and directly from the fisherman. Um, this is what she knows. Um, and she has no idea that she lives sort of in a microcosm of exception. Um, and so what I think today is all about and tomorrow is all about is to help all of us create a world where it's not exceptional to get our food directly from the source and that the source be a sustainable source. Um, so. Um, I have the great honor of introducing our panelists today who are going to kind of help us set the tone for the day. Um, and um, what we'll do is we'll have each of our panelists talk for about 10 or 15 minutes to introduce you to their area of expertise. We've got some fisheries folks, some farm folks, some folks from overseas. I'll tell you a little bit more about who they are in a second. Um, so we'll let them present to you, and some of them are using some visuals. Um, and then, if you could, hold your questions and your comments till the end. But what I'd like to ask you to do is if you have a question or a comment, jot it down. Um, right when it occurs to you so that you don't have to spend the rest of the time trying to remember what your question or comment is, which means that you're not going to listen to the next speaker. So go ahead and write down what it is that you have to say or comment, and we'll have an opportunity for that, for that as soon as all four of them are done. Um, I'm going to introduce all of them, and then I'll hand it over to these guys, and they can, they can share the program with you. We're going to hear from Angelika Plöger. Yes. From Germany. Um, Angelika is head of the Department of Organic Food Quality and Food Culture at the University of Kassel in Germany. Welcome to the United States. Um, she has more than 25 years working in the field of organic foods. She's co-founder of the International Association of Organic Food Quality and Health. And she's chair of the German Association of Nutrition Behavior, chair of the International Association for Science of Food Culture and a member of the advisory board of the Federal German Ministry for Food, Agriculture, and Consumer Protection. That's a lot of good stuff. <laughs> um, so she is going to start for us, um, and she's going to kind of set the tone and talk about some of the challenges that we're facing today. Um, and then we're going to hear from Elliot Coleman. Um, Elliot is founder and owner of Four Season Farm right here in Maine. Um, and just as a side anecdote, years ago, his daughter and I uh, worked together at Sea Kayak Guides right here in Frenchman Bay, so it's kind of fun to meet um, her dad. Uh, Elliot is a renowned farmer and owner of four, four Season Farm, as I said, in Harborside here in Maine. He's the author of The New Organic Grower, Four Season Harvest, and The Winter Harvest Handbook. He's got more than 40 years of experience in all aspects of organic farming, including field vegetables, greenhouse vegetables, rotational grazing of cattle and sheep, and range poultry. And he has pioneered the development of simple, movable greenhouse designs and the practice of commercial winter vegetable production in unheated high tunnels. So this is kind of neat stuff. Um, then we'll hear from Ted Ames of the Penobscot East Resource Center. Ted is both a fisherman and a fisheries researcher in historical fisheries ecology and fishermen's ecological knowledge. His work mapping spawning areas for cod in the Gulf of Maine led to identification of fine-scale stock structure for cod in the Gulf of Maine. 
He is captain and owner of the fishing vessel Mary Elizabeth and has fished for ground fish and scallops for 24 seasons, lobsters for 27 seasons, and has extensive additional fisheries experience. In 2006 or seven, somewhere in there, uh, I can't remember the exact date and I didn't get a chance to check with Ted. The MacArthur Foundation awarded Ted with the Revered Genius Grant for his groundbreaking work in fisheries. And then finally, we'll hear from John Piotti, who is the executive, Piotti, I think that's right, <laughs> who is the executive director of Maine Farmland Trust. Um, established in 1999, the Maine Farmland Trust is Maine's only statewide land trust focused exclusively on farmland. Their mission is to, excuse me, is to protect and preserve Maine's farmland keep agricultural lands working, and support the future of farming in Maine. And if he probably wasn't already busy enough, um, John is also the majority leader in the Maine House. Um, one thing that makes me particularly excited about this con conference is um, the effort that the organizers have made to really highlight the connections between farming and fisheries issues within the context of sustainable food systems. So I think that that's kind of an innovative approach um, that you don't necessarily always hear about. You tend to have the fisheries people talking over here and the farming people over here. So it's, this will be a great opportunity to have the two groups come together and this will happen through the course of the day. And I think this is a great start right here this morning. So with that, I think I'd like to hand it over to Angelica. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, students over there. Hopefully some are down here. And I would like to say uh, that I'm proud to be here and, and that I would like to thank all the people having organized this marvelous event, this conference, and of course also our exchange between students and scientists between the College of the Atlantic um, Farm Research Center, that is the organic research center in Great Britain, and our university in Kassel-Witzenhausen, that's in Germany. So thank you to the most powerful triangle, I would say, I learned yesterday evening. Thank you to Polly, to Ginger, and to Alexandra. I learned yesterday that the slogan from Obama, yes, we can, it's originally made by you. Because, <laughs> because you told us yesterday evening that um, you probably are always saying, let's start now, don't wait. Let's try, we can do it. And by the way, our German Chancellor Angelika Merkel, she thought, yes, we can would be a nice uh, slogan also for her, but she decided then to say, uh, we are powerful. So I would say, you are powerful by, um, supporting us with our ideas, with our exchange, and hopefully the students will present tomorrow morning, I think, something of their work they have done during the last summer course we have had all together. So, something I would like to add as well is that we, uh, we the Kassel University, and here the College of the Atlantic have the same history. So we were founded in 1970, on the 1970s, and therefore I will start with this PowerPoint presentation with uh, Schumacher, who had published a book, Small is Beautiful, and in this book there is a sentence called, a lifestyle designed for permanence we are seeking for. And that is something I would try to develop now during my PowerPoint presentation by giving you, let's see if, yeah, by giving you an overview about sustainable food farming and fishery for the 21st century. So what are the challenges we are uh, facing? First of all, I would like to say something about biocapacity and footprint. Then the loss of biodiversity, the water stress and climatic change, and then last not least, also something about our lifestyle, especially our nutrition style. So from my point of view, eating and drinking, so our nutrition is the most intensive relation of human to nature. We are incorporated each day, several times nature, and everything what we are giving to nature will come back to us, good or bad things. So that is something we have to consider. 
I will point out some data from the Living Planet report published in 2008. It was published by the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. And uh, this gives a great overview. And if you have time, please go into the internet and download this report because it's really excellent. So everybody is talking about footprint, but nobody is talking about the relation between footprint and biocapacity f uh, factors. So what is uh, biocapacity? That is the area you are living on or you are producing on and the bioproductivity. So that all together means you have a special biocapacity and this special biocapacity can change. Of course, because the climate can change, but also because the soil structure can, change, can be changed or the technology can be changed. On the other hand, you have the footprint, that means the population, the consumption per person and the resources and of course the waste intensity. And to have a look here, you see that today the biocapacity bio is 2.1 um, global hectare per person and the footprint is already 2.7 global hectare per person. So we have really a gap between the biocapacity and the footprint. Of course, you can consider this problem from two sides. You can, of course, try to increase the biocapacity or you can go more the by, uh, behavioral side, I would say, to reduce your footprints. Here is a picture out of this report giving you an idea which um, areas in the world are consuming more than they are able to, um, to give to the world. So all the deep green or light green countries are those countries producing more than they are taking from the world and all the red or uh, reddish countries are consuming more than they can produce. And e especially the, in those countries, a change of habits of lifestyle have to be uh, started now. Here is an uh, overhead about the ecological footprint and population by the regions. And as you can see probably here, here you can see the population in millions, and here you can see the ecological footprint in global hectare per person. You are the leading country, so North America is the leading one, then followed by Europe, then by non-European uh, states, Latin America, the Middle East and Central Africa, Asia and Africa. So that is the footprint, but what is more interested what is about the biocapacity and the relation to footprint. And here you can see that we do have some countries, for instance, Africa and Latin America, giving us more than they are consuming. And on the other hand, America, also Europe and Asia are those countries having um, um, eating more or drinking more, having a complex lifestyle and consuming more than their biocapacity. The question is, can it go on in that way? Probably you can read here, no, on the side here, that is numbers of planets, so numbers of Earth, and we are above one already. So the question is, is our ecological footprint, or our ecological depth now going um, down? or are we consuming as we have been consuming for the last centuries? And trade is something very important for this and this gives you just an impression how much is going from other countries to the EU where I'm living. The second problem is the loss of biodiversity. Here you can see a statement from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and it says that we have because we are using so much from our ecosystems and don't take care of, of the different varieties and seeds and, and breeds so on, that we have a really tremendous loss of biodiversity. And this um, Living Planet uh, report uh, created a new index, it's called the Living Planet Index, 
and this index is an in indicator designing to monitor the state of the world's biodiversity. And as you can see here, there's a decline by minus 28% uh, between the years of 1970 to, nine, to 2005. And they monitored um, 4,600 populations of nearly 1,700 species. And of course, going more into detail, which would be appropriate at this time, but unfortunately the time is limited, you will see that, for instance, in the fresh water, we have a really a heavy decline in uh, species and populations, and uh, also in the terrestrial area. And yesterday evening, we learned already that there is a, a group of people looking for biodiversity, so the group of uh, slow food. And uh, here, for instance, we have an example of um, the Slow Food Bi uh, Foundation for Biodiversity, and they created an arc. You can see it here on the picture. And everything which is, uh, is in danger from our food and varieties and breeds should be put into the arc and should be kept and protected. But what does it mean protected and kept? So use it or lose it is the motto. Here you can see the same cow I showed you before from Poland living in the area of a river called Narev. And in relation to that, of course, um, there was a program educating the farmers from those areas to be proud of their products for the regional consumption and, of course, the, they had more added value in the region by doing the milk processing. The other challenge is water stress and the climatic change. As you can see from the pictures, we have um, increasing areas where you can find just sand, nothing else. And um, this report stated that more than 50 countries are currently facing moderate or severe water stress. What has it to do with our nutrition? So here I just put out two, um, two different foods. For instance, to produce beef, you need 15,500 liters per kilogram beef, 15,500 liters of water. And that makes up for 23% of the global water use in agriculture. And that means for each of us 1,150 liters of water per person and per day to eat one kilogram of beef meat. That includes, of course, the water which is used for producing the feed, that is the water for slaughtering, which is needed or for processing. The other uh, topic is 1,500 liters per kilogram of cane sugar. And because we are eating on average 70 grams of sugar per day, that makes an equivalent of 100 liters of water. And considering how much is made with sugar in our daily lifestyle, you can imagine how much water is needed for that. So the other is the climatic change and the nutrition. So here you can see a picture just roughly showing you the difference between a hamburger made from meat or a veggie burger made from carrots and grain. The energy which is put into this hamburger, that are 250 grams of meat, so not a very large one, is 8,170, uh, 170 kilojoule per this uh, unit. And uh, it will produce nearly 800 grams of CO2. We call it CO2 equivalent because methane is also produced, but you can calculate it as CO2 equivalent. The same for the veggie burger. You can see there's only half the energy needed for producing this, and only 63 uh, grams of CO2 equivalent are produced, because here you have no methane in the production cycle. Or going a little bit more deeper into this, um, the question was, can we change by, use, by changing our lifestyle, also um, our CO2 emissions, for instance? So based on our average consumption in Germany, based on the year 2002, the nutrition um, as being a vegan, for instance, will produce 33 kilograms CO2 per year 
when it comes from organic agriculture, the same nutrition style but coming from conventional will need more than or will emit more than twice uh, uh, the effect of CO2. Yeah. And the nutrition uh, style as being a vegetarian, you can see it more than 10 times. And being an omnivore, so eating everything needs also uh, from, from the vegetarian to the omnivore, it's doubling. So to go more for a lifestyle or a nutrition style, more for reducing meat, for instance, or other milk products would be appropriate. But what does it mean for agriculture? I think we have to discuss it afterwards in our workshop when we have this uh, workshop about sustainable nutrition. So what my uh, motto will be, think globally, act locally. And our students from the master program, International Food Business and Consumer Studies, they just uh, planned a conference now on the 15th and 16th of October under this logo. Think globally, act locally, and it's time for action. And I would be very glad if you are coming to the workshop for further information on the workshop of sustainable nutrition. I thank you very much. need that till the very end. I liked what was said in the introduction. I've always been someone who felt that our society spent far too much eulogizing the problem and not enough time connecting the farmer to the solution. And I've been interested in solutions since I started farming. And so I just thought four quick points, uh, some background and the reality of organic farming, an imaginary story I'm going to tell you, the reaction to the story, and then a little bit more about small farms. When I wanted to get into farming, I was able to buy some land. It was very poor land. It was all covered with spruce and fir trees. It had an initial pH of 4.3. Uh, very poor soil and it was covered with rocks in addition to trees. Uh, if we had started on uh, a few acres of uh, deep loam in Iowa, uh, then maybe people could say, oh, I guess you can feed people, but you have to have good soil to start with. Number one, you don't. We've been able to turn what we started with into some of the best uh, soil in Maine. And that's the key with organic agriculture. It works. In fact, it works so much better than most people are aware of that most people cannot believe how well it works. And so every time I read uh, stories about we have to decide which 50 million people are going to starve if we shift to organic agriculture and so forth, I realize this is written by people who have absolutely no idea how well it works. And I just want to use our farm as a quick example. Our gross returns for the last few years have been $80,000 an acre uh, on vegetables. And these are not high-priced vegetables. These are normally uh, priced vegetables. Our quality is so good that the toughest critics of vegetables, and by that I mean children, are our most enthusiastic fans, including their parents, who tell us in a stunned tone, I don't believe it. He likes your spinach. <laughs> it is possible to grow food with flavor and nutrition and get little children to eat it. And in addition, we have commensurate high yields. Anyone who tells you, oh, well, organic farming's fine, but uh, the yields aren't high enough, well, we just completed our potato harvest the other day, and when multiplied out at the rate we were harvesting, uh, our harvest came to 25 tons to the acre. Go up to Aroostook County, ask them if we're doing well on potatoes. I guarantee you we're doing well on potatoes. 
and all our other crops. We grow 35 different crops, both in the field and in the greenhouse. In other words, we can feed the world. So now that we got the facts down, I want to tell you an imaginary story. This is totally imaginary. It's a tale about the organic farmers of Hancock County, Maine. That's where we all live here. And I'm an investigative reporter, and I've been sent up to investigate the organic farmers of Hancock County, Maine. And the first thing I find out is that their farming system is so economically unsound that 40% of their yearly income arrives in the form of a government subsidy check. I have also found out in my investigative reporting that their weed control techniques have affected the aquifers to the point that 60% of the samples tested show residues. The huge CAFO, Concentrated Animal Feeding Unit, run by the Hancock County Organic Farmers, have, and because they have such unsound manure handling practices, 100 wells in one town alone were polluted with E. coli, coliform bacteria, and other contaminants found in manure. Further, numerous scientists have complained that they are prevented from investigating these suspicious, scientifically questionable techniques advocated by the Hancock County organic farmers because they are not allowed to do those investigations. Furthermore, 98% of the U.S. Department of Agriculture research funds are spent on the behalf of the Hancock County organic farmers, and only 2% are spent on other systems of agriculture. And to top it all off, after decades of organic farming in Hancock County, there is now a hypoxic dead zone in Penobscot Bay the size of Rhode Island. Well, you can imagine if instead of being an imaginative tale that that were true, you can imagine the reaction in the press. Organic farming is responsible for all of those problems? How come we are not stopping this immediately? There would be an uproar that you can't believe. Now, all of those imaginary ills that I just mentioned are actually from articles in the New York Times and other papers about industrial agriculture. And yet, we sit here and almost numb-like, we tolerate that situation when the solution is right in front of our eyes. And how have we become so numbed? Well, organic farmers are talking about the future, but the agriculture of the past has armies of lobbyists and spin doctors. They work tirelessly to defend the status quo. I don't know if you, any of you remember, but back when Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, came out, the attack upon her and her character that was put together by Monsanto and other chemical companies was almost embarrassing. The, uh, Monsanto went to great lengths to, to get the uh, publisher who was about to put out the book against the grain to stop. Fortunately, they found another publisher. They got the uh, printer who was going to print the ecologist's uh, Monsanto issue to not print it. For, fortunately, the ecologist found another printer. This is a very, very powerful operation. They have spin doctors. Now, the fact that as a society we can talk about spin doctors is really an interesting thing. They know they are lying to us. We know they are lying to us, and they know that we know <laughs> they are lying to us, and yet we speak about these people as if, if this is a normal part of society. Now, they are protecting the status quo 
But I think there's another reason why small farms, it has been so easy to marginalize them. I happen to think the small farm is the most single subversive unit in our culture. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson wrote that he didn't think we could have a democracy unless at least 25% of our population knew how to feed themselves because you needed at least that percentage who could tell the government to stuff it when they didn't like the policies. Now, what do, why are small farming so subversive? Well, let's look at what happens out there. Animals reproduce themselves. If you have a chicken and it lays an egg, and you hatch that egg, you have another chicken. Plants reproduce themselves. You let that lettuce go to seed, and you have next year's lettuce seeds. Grass grows without any help, and it is the single best food for feeding cattle and sheep and up to 40% of the input for uh, poultry, actually a lot more of that if it's a goose. Animals produce free fertilizer. You don't have to buy it. I mean, grapes grow and we can make wine. <laughs> Apples grow and we can make hard cider. And root crops store easily in holes in the ground to feed us all winter. That is definitely subversive. Now, not, most of you aren't old enough, but I'm going to finish up by mentioning one of the most delightful cartoon characters that was ever created. And this cartoon character was called the Shmoo. S-H-M-O-O, -O, created by a cartoonist named Al Cap. And Al Cap used to do a cartoon about uh, these wonderful people who lived in a very little rural town called Dog Patch, and his hero was Little Abner. And a schmoo, the fictional cartoon creature, first appeared in the, the comic strip in 1948 and actually quickly became a national craze at the time. A schmoo is shaped like a plump bowling pin with legs. It has smooth skin, eyebrows, no arms and nose, and it always has a big smile on its face. This is how Al Cap described the schmoo. They are very prolific. They require no sustenance other than air. Schmoos are delicious to eat and are eager to be eaten. If a human looks at one hungrily, it will happily immolate itself either by jumping into a frying pan, after which they taste like chicken, or into a broiling pan, after which they taste like steak. When roasted, they taste like pork. When baked, they taste like catfish. And raw, they taste like oysters on the half shell. Every morning, the schmooz would produce eggs, neatly packaged in boxes, milk in grade A bottles, and butter, no churning required. Uh, and furthermore, the frolicking of all these schmoos is so entertaining, such as their, their staged schmoozical comedies, that people no longer felt the need to watch television or go to the movies. Now, this was a delightful character. You can see why it caught everybody's attention back then. Little Abner was able to get these schmoos by going into this secret valley that was guarded by the industrialists. He, he broke in, and the man who was taking care of the schmoos told him that they were the greatest menace to humanity the world has ever known. And Little Abner asked him, is that because they're so bad? And the man said, no, stupid. It's because they're so good. And what happened was he leads them out of the valley, and all of a sudden, people are getting fed. They're getting the best food they could ever imagine. They have their eggs, their milk, and their butter. And the schmoo crisis unfolds. We'll get to that in a minute. 
little, the Al Cap wrote how he invented the idea of the shmoo. And he said, I was driving from New York City to my farm in New Hampshire. The top of my car was down, and on either side I could see the lush, lovely New England countryside. It was the good earth at its generous summertime best, offering gifts to us all. And the thought that came to me was this. Here we have this great and good and generous thing, the earth. It's eager to give us everything we need. All we have to do is just let it alone, just be happy with it. And so that was how this wonderful little imaginative animal that fed and took care of people came about. Well, the industrialists were obviously unhappy. Schmooze were officially declared to be a national menace, and they were systematically hunted down and slaughtered because they were deemed bad for business. And in the last picture at the end of the cartoon, you see Lil Abner saluting the slaughter of the, of the schmooze because, as he's saying, if the authorities say they must go, then they must go. Well, and here's the last best part of this. After this came out, Al Cap was attacked by both the right wing and the left wing. The communists thought he was making fun of socialism and Marxism. The right wing thought he was making fun of capitalism and the American way. In other words, if you look at history, you will find that uh, Soviet Russia was just as effective at getting rid of the small farm as capitalist America has been. Since none of those powers out there want this delightful little creature to exist that feeds us all so wonderfully such magnificent food, I just want to say it is up to all of us to defend the Schmoo farm in the battle against all its detractors. And I thank you very much. Thank you. It's pretty hard to uh, uh, compete with little Abner. <laughs> Somewhere I have a PowerPoint here. Uh, oh, here we go. Some of us are accused of being um, electronically illiterate. Some of us boast of being semi-literate. <laughs> I'm between those two. Uh, Penobscot East is, is the uh, firm that I'm part of. Uh, we're a small nonprofit, and uh, our, our uh, main concern is community-based management and small-scale fisheries, uh, particularly in the eastern half of Maine. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, we are dealing with a whole suite of complex problems in our end as well as in uh, farming. And I couldn't resist but putting a picture on here because that's really the central part of what this whole issue is about, which is the freshest and best, highest quality foods seem to be grown locally. 
and it's true for fishing as well. Uh, if you can get your fish caught close to home, then you have a pretty good chance of having some really good quality seafood. Um, by the way, how many people here have ever caught a fish? Oh, make my day. It was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, how many of you catch all the fish you eat? I didn't raise my hand either. And I, know, I have noticed a couple of really good fishermen here who didn't raise their hand. That's because most of us don't have the time to do it on our own. But it would be nice if we had a system that allowed it. Um, but access to local food uh, is our only real connection to freshness and quality. And perhaps it's the only real alternative to avoiding food additives. But maintaining access to local supplies of food is probably the greatest challenge we all confront today. Because today, most of our ground fish are landed by corporate boats, uh, usually from Canada or Massachusetts, uh, not from here. That's because getting access to federal waters isn't easy anymore, not to go fishing. And if you or a fisherman from this area can't get a fishing permit, it means you have to buy something that somebody else caught somewhere else, processed it, and shipped it back here. And it probably won't be as fresh as if you had it yourself right here. But have you heard the haddock are back. A big haddock recovery has happened in New England, and good fishing is supposed to be right here today. The haddock fishery is reported to be fully recovered. Actually, it has, but you have to go two or three hundred miles away to find them. You've certainly heard about that. But I'll wager you haven't heard that ground fish in the northern, northeastern third of the whole New England coastal shelf collapsed about 10, 12, 14 years ago and still is collapsed. Virtually no cod, no haddock, no cusk, virtually no winter flounder, gray sole, etc., have been landed from Penobscot East to Canada. 150 miles of coast. Very productive historically for more than a decade. Still isn't. As far as ground fish are concerned, we live in the middle of a 5,000 square mile desert. Um, this is a map showing an enormous tagging study that occurred, uh, just finished last year. Uh, a tagging study of codfish. 110,000 fish were tagged. Uh, the red lines and red dots are where cod were retrieved. Ten squares were where they were tagged. You can see there's a hole in the donut on the side of the donut as well. That's us. From the eastern end of Casco Bay to Canada, there have been virtually no tag returns for codfish out of 110,000 that have been tagged. Now, one of the peculiar things about uh, the marine ecology is it's a very complex system. And unlike farmers, fishermen, the biggest fisherman is the man who has the biggest farm truck. 
and you go out and you fill it up, but you don't fertilize it, you don't uh, nurture them, uh, you don't do much of anything except bring them in. That's been the traditional way. It's closer to hunter and gathering. But we're in transition, and a group of us are pushing it along, along with what we're trying to do with this stuff. Uh, but the bottom line is right today, um, no fish means no fishermen. For 150 miles of our small New England coast, one-third of it, once prime fishing grounds, uh, there's no f ground fishermen left. Local production for ground fish is eliminated. And we need ground fishing here because the only other fishery we have left is lobster. Without ground fish for a backup, our coastal fisheries are pretty fragile. But it's not all gloom and doom. Even though there's a great change happening in our coastal fisheries, there's also an opportunity to restore it and the rest of the coastal shelf ecology for us all. There are certain things that have to be done in the near term that we can and are trying to come to terms with right now. Uh, we simply have to preserve fishermen's rights because what happened in Alaska was when they went to an ITQ system, they ended up saying, oh no, the, the fishing communities need not have any rights. We'll just let it go. And then several years later, after the local fishermen had all gone out of business, they said, oh, we'll give quota to these fishing communities. But because nobody had access rights in the form of permits, the only thing the communities could do was to lease or sell it to the industrial fleet. And we don't want to get caught in that situation. So Penobscot East Resource Center and the Down East Groundfish Initiative uh, are starting a permit bank. We're working in concert with uh, Northwest Atlantic uh, NAMA and uh, with Island Institute in Port Clyde who are also putting together a permit bank and our goal is the same. Our permit bank in particular is to try to create uh, access rights for local fishermen to catch hooks, fish with hooks and, and uh, long lines. And the rationale behind that is if we can uh, uh, protect habitat at the same time that we're catching fish, we're way ahead of the game. And I've not been keeping up with my, my uh, slides. Uh, one of the other things that we need to do that's very pressing in the short term is to establish local markets. And Gloucester and Nama have done incredible things with marketing there. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, Port Clyde, with the help of Island Institute, has started a filleting house to take and distribute local fish there. It's a wonderful job there underway. We are, uh, this past winter, had a community uh, um, lobster sale from our fish pier and have been selling both halibut and uh, uh, shrimp uh, when it's available from our local fisheries. But for Stonington and Vinyl Haven and East, there are no active ground fishermen left. So it makes it kind of tricky to flesh that out. But the purpose is to put fresh fish back in our own hands. And so that it doesn't happen again, we've started a program called CIFAR, which uh, uh, we work with fishermen 
uh, to help them deal effectively with, with management and regulators and the legislature. Uh, and we also uh, introduced this fisherman created uh, principles so that it isn't just a matter of going down the bay and filling up your farm truck fishing vessel, but is really a matter of being stewards of the resource you depend on. In the long term, we have a little longer objective. Uh, we absolutely need area management. Do you realize that Port Clyde is the easternmost U.S. port left in the United States? It's not Eastport. It's not Jonesport or Lubeck or even Mount Desert Island here. It's Port Clyde one-third of the width of, of, uh, of the whole Gulf of uh, the whole Gulf of Maine coastal shelf in New England. Yikes. Here's the area that we've proposed for an area management approach. Um, we uh, uh, we need area management because right now the scale of the fishery is too large and we simply can't get there otherwise. We need it because uh, we want local supplies of seafood uh, that will benefit us in our towns along the coast. Here's some of the guys we'd like to get and there's who we are. And thank you very much. And I put this last slide up because I just wanted you to see what some of the more popular fishing grounds in this area that uh, no longer produces fish are. The red blotches are spawning grounds and the brown our fishing grounds. And these were historically active for 150 years that I know of and uh, ceased to be so only 15, 18 years ago. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. I, I don't have any photographs with me for this presentation, but um, I'm giving, I'm part of a workshop next, and I have slides for that, so that, that's an advertisement. <laughs> uh, I'm John Piotti, as, as Natalie said. I've been working on sustainable agriculture and food system issues for a little over 15 years, and during that period, I've, I've seen a lot of changes. I, I really feel like I've been part of a movement that's been growing. Um, it's been very positive. And I've been heartened by some of what I've seen. I, it's been particularly heartening in the last few years as there's been a growth of really popular understanding and popular appreciation of what we're doing for all the reasons that all of you know. But I'm also disheartened by where we are right now, today. We obviously have a long way still to go. I'm an optimist by nature. And I'm an optimist that we will eventually have a sustainable system of agriculture. And the reason is not just because I'm Pollyannish about this, but because I don't think we have any other choice. We have to get it right. And generally speaking, people ultimately, after, when they have no other alternatives, they usually do do the right thing. My fear is what's going to happen in that intervening period before we, between now and when we get there which could be 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now, when we will have a sustainable food system. But there can be a lot of disruptions in that intervening time. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But first I want to jump to what is a sustainable food system, and we could talk about that for a whole conference, um, not in a couple of moments. But in my mind, a lot of it has to do with um, growing or harvesting more food, 
um, close to home in a greater variety of ways um, by more people. It's really a theme of abundance and of diversity. It's talking about more eggs in more baskets, not just growing eggs in different ways, not just having different kinds of eggs, but having them in a whole variety of different baskets. We need multiple scales, including the scale of individuals growing a lot more of their food, moving towards Elliott's and Thomas Jefferson's goal of 25%. Actually, in a state like Maine, I think it can and should far exceed 25% of, of um, our citizens uh, growing their own food. We need multiple distribution channels. We need to be talking about a whole range of things. And there is, no, there is no single answer. There is no single gene, as Raj was saying last night, or any silver bullet, or in the spirit of Maine hunting season, there isn't even a silver buckshot here. Um, we need a great variety of options out there to distribute our products. Um, a lot of the options that have been developed in the last 15, 20 years, CSAs, a lot more direct marketing, those are valuable things. They need to be continued, but I think the future will have even more options. And finally, that system is going to be tailored to local conditions. Um, sustainable agriculture is not going to have a trademark after it. It's not going to be something that's franchised and what works one place works somewhere else. Sure, there will be lessons that can be shared, but by and large, it has to be developed for the region. I think of Maine, for instance, where we grow grass extremely well. And we've sort of turned our back on that. And our dairy farms are only relatively recently utilizing pasture. They're still based on a grain economy. Well, our future might very well involve growing a lot of livestock because the underpinning the resource of grass is here and grows well in this state. Now, just as an aside, most of the dairy products in this country now in the fastest growing dairy states are desert states. Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico. It's amazing. That's where the dairy growth has been. What is milk? It's water and grass. <laughs> and, and we have somehow moved to a system where most of it is being produced in places where there is no water and they have no ability to grow grass. I want to talk a little bit about Maine. I want to talk about it in part because I think some of the things that are happening here are indicative of what is happening and what can happen elsewhere. I also want to talk about it because I know about it. And, and I, I think, wouldn't the world be wonderful if people primarily talked about things that they knew? It would be the end to talk radio, for one thing. Um, but I'm digressing. In, in Maine, we've seen some great growth in sustainable agriculture, much of it oriented towards local markets. We've seen the number of farms grow in the last um, federal census. The ag census is done every five years. The last one was 2007. We've seen the number of farms grow in our state from about 7,000 to over 8,000. We've seen our acres in production go up by about 8 or 9 percent, most of that oriented um, towards local production. And we have a state where, better or worse, it happens to be the truth, we now have the oldest population in the country. We exceeded Florida in the last federal census. But we have the fifth youngest farmer population in the country. So there have been a lot of things that have been happening right here. And I give a lot of credit to people who moved to this state uh, 20 and 30 years ago, the Back to the Landers bringing some new ideas. I give a lot of credit to the existing old families who have a 400-year history in some cases of figuring out how to make it work. And I give a lot of credit to some of the organizations. Uh, Russ Libby from MOFCA is here. MOFCA has done a phenomenal job over 30-plus years. Um, <laughs> Um, I'd like to think that some other organizations have been part of that as well. I worked for a dozen years for Coastal Enterprises during a period where we helped farms transition from commodity markets to local production, help them access new markets, help them develop marketing materials to do that and the like. A lot of players doing a lot of very interesting things. 
and as a result, there's a lot of good news. But let's not fool ourselves. There's still a lot of problems with Maine agriculture, and we're certainly far from feeding ourselves as a state, let alone what we should as a rural region be doing for some of the more urban areas around us. The vast majority of agriculture in Maine is still commodity-based. Um, most of our dairy, most of our blueberries, most of our potatoes are all um, in one form or another industrial agriculture. Um, if you want to take a step back and look at agriculture in Maine, the term that's sometimes used is a bifurcation. We have two paths. We have our commodity farms, um, some of our larger farms, and of course in Maine even our largest farms are small by national standards. All 350 or so of our dairy farms have fewer cows than a few single dairies in California and in Idaho. Um, put things in perspective. But still for us, they're larger farms selling to commodity markets. That's one path. And the other path is this resurgence of local farms and folks serving local markets. It's usually termed local agriculture now. It might be organic. It might be natural. It might be sustainable. But the prime distinction is it's people who are marketing direct or close to direct through a farmer's market or a CSA or something like that. And that second path is where a lot of the growth has been where a lot of the positive developments are, but it's still a relatively small percentage of our agriculture. But I don't mean to give the impression that that new path is, is, is good and the old path is bad. Because in Maine, and I suspect in many other places, they actually work with each other fairly well, and they're both necessary in this interesting transition period that we're in. And I view it as a transition period. I honestly think, as I mentioned earlier, that in 15 or 20 or 25 years, we're not going to have to have these discussions because we're going to have figured it out. And if we haven't figured it out, we're going to have bigger problems. So it's this middle world where the markets haven't quite figured it out yet. And we, during this period, need to do a few things very right to make sure that we keep alive the options for the future. Now, the biggest farms in Maine, they do some important things. For one thing, they keep that as land that is not developed. So even though it may not be the best agricultural practices right now or in a long-term view be sustainable, they are keeping that land from having house lots and parking lots on it, which is critical to keeping options open for our future. They also provide the critical mass that gives us a lot of the infrastructure that is needed. These smaller farms rely on the fact that there are grain supplies and, and uh, um, equipment dealers and people who know how to fix farm equipment and bankers who will actually still loan to a farmer. On the other side, I am seeing increasingly positive signs of these folks who have been dabbling in local agriculture passing on lessons to the bigger operators. There's more than one potato farm in Aroostook County now that is still growing 1,000 acres worth of potatoes that go to the McCain's processing plant, but have been seeing what direct marketing can do and might now have 20 or 30 acres of organic potatoes that they're working with someone else to market, maybe somewhere um, through the Boston market or to Portland restaurants. You know, you go into a bookstore and you go into the business section and what does it say? It says, half of the books are titled about getting to know your customer. And what we've done in agriculture through agricultural policy and a whole bunch of other things over the last 75 years is systematically removed our farmers from knowing their customers. And a lot of this local agriculture that's been building is making those connections and also helping other farmers who aren't in that business see where there are opportunities. So it's not an us versus them thing. And again, I give great credit to Russ Libby, who, although as executive director of MOFCA, has chaired the Agricultural Council of Maine and has really found common ground. And in Maine, not always, there are some very frustrating days sometimes. It's one in the legislature last year when we were dealing with the pesticide board. But by and large in Maine, there's this understanding that agriculture has to embrace both sides because what we really need to do is keep options open for the future. I want to tell you very quickly about sort of my path through agriculture because I started out 15 years ago 
helping farmers write business plans, helping farmers access new markets during a period where there were a lot of farms that had to begin a switch to local agriculture. And I've transitioned to right now working for an organization whose primary focus is preserving the land base. Now granted, Maine Farmland Trust is involved more broadly in preserving farming and keeping farming vital than just protecting land. We're part of a movement of many land trusts. I like to think we were really at the cutting edge of it, of thinking of the system much more broadly, thinking of the need to bring new farmers in. We have a farm link program that's been very active. We've made 50 links in the last four years. That's 50 farms that will go on to a next generation. We do farm vitality work to help keep farms profitable, realizing that's another way of keeping um, uh, farms around for the future. But the core of our work, nonetheless, is preserving the farmland base. Because in this transitionary period, in my mind, we've gone in Maine from having access to markets be the principal bottleneck to the availability of land in the future. We have a growing population that wants the products that Maine farms can produce. We have young people who want to farm to the extent that there is a barrier to entry. It's usually the affordability of the land and that ties into land preservation because the only way I know to make land more affordable is to preserve it so it exchanges hands of its value as farmland rather than as developable land. And then finally, we have the land base itself which needs to be preserved in order to keep those options open. I mentioned earlier and Raj mentioned last night uh, that there is no single gene, there is no single silver bullet. I don't know what the answers are, but I think there's going to be a diversity of solutions tailored towards different places. And at least for me, I've made my focus recently, since I don't have the solutions and I'm not sure I'm the right person to come up with them, the focus of the work of my organization has been on keeping the land base there so when the solutions arise, we'll still be poised and able to take the important steps we need to for the future. I think my time is up. I thank you very much. Now I'd just like to open it up for anyone who has any questions or comments. Right over here. I have a question for John. Uh, you mentioned frustration regarding the board pesticide control. Yes. And uh, I've been fighting that for years in terms of, you know, the image they supposedly have is that they're protecting the public and yet their employees from the Department of Agriculture does exactly the opposite in every issue around pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. Can you give us any hope in that? Well, my, my comment actually had to do with a confirmation hearing and as, as Natalie mentioned, I have a dark underside uh, and I'm a politician and uh, uh, I'm the House Majority Leader now, but I used to chair the Ag Committee, so that's really where my, my heart is. And uh, we had a confirmation hearing for someone to, to be placed on the Board of Agriculture that was an organic blueberry farmer. Would have been a wonderful addition to the board. And it, it's less about the details and more about the big picture. But what happened, and offline, Russ or I can talk to you about this in more detail, but what happened is we saw a, a, a really a breakdown and, and arguments being put forward that really got to the core of organic versus conventional. Um, it really became an ideological battle that I hadn't seen the likes of in the state for a while. It was eye-opening to me because maybe I can be naive at times, but I really thought that a lot of good work by a lot of people over many years had brought those walls down in Maine. Not that there were differences, weren't still differences, but they were different. Um, and that was a very sad day. It was actually the saddest day I've ever spent in the State House. And, uh, and that's saying a lot, because we have some frustrating days. Um, but the bottom line on all of it is that I, I do think there's been great progress in Maine bringing those worlds together. But I also think um, that there's a lot more work to do, and there's a lot of um, deep, rooted issues and problems. You know, sometimes, I was talking to Raj last night a little bit, and we were talking about the, 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 the concept of being from away, and one of the things that I told him is, is, is that's the line that people use on you sometimes, 
when they've run out of other arguments and there's nothing left and they just have to have something to you know, peg somebody with. And I, I think in some ways that's what we saw with this board of pesticide control thing as well. Um, there was just no other rational reason to prevent something from happening. So they just sort of reverted to um, visceral reaction. Um, just real quick, for those who aren't familiar, MOFCA is the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. Uh, Steve. So, Anna, I wonder if you could tell us a little more about the differences between an individual transferable quota system and the permit bank that you described. That's a real can of worms. Um, as you know, our ground fish fishery has been is in the process of being converted to catch shares, which are ITQs, individual transferable quotas. And right now, my understanding is the council, is the New England Fisheries Council, is uh, determining whether the distribution is to be strictly on historical landings uh, during the last few years, or uh, size of the vessel, horsepower, et cetera, or some combination. And I'm not sure just where it has ended up now. There are uh, uh, several individuals in the audience that can clarify that point. But our permit bank uh, at this point is collecting permits with landings history. Uh, if anybody's got a lot of money and wants to help the small-scale fishermen, the way to do it would be to buy a permit and uh, or donate funds to buy a permit and put it in the bank. Our game plan is to uh, purchase uh, as many credible, worthless permits that have no landings history and then raise funds to buy a large vessel's historical landings, subdivide it and distribute it among the fishermen so that we can have small scale fisheries going along our coast again. Uh, it's tricky turf at this point. It's truly a transitional period and we're hoping we can make the system work. Good question, thank you. Thank you, Ted. We have a question right here. I think the question was, uh, has the federal government explored the cause of dead zones, and is there a role for the federal government in researching these? Is that correct? Okay, great. Well, having fished through the east part of Penobscot Bay, I wasn't aware there was any dead space. Um, uh, it's Oh, those were not dead spots. Those were historical fishing grounds that had been extremely productive for the last 150 years. And the red lines inshore were locations where cod and haddock used to reproduce. Uh, our area is historically one of the more productive areas in the world in terms of ground fish production. And, uh, one third of it, 5,000 square miles of it, no longer is producing ground fish at all. Fishermen don't even bother to come here from other places. But the federal government is trying to deal with it, but their charge uh, from Congress is to assess the total population, or the population of these fish throughout their entire range, take an average value, and then uh, arrange fishing regulations that uh, allow a sustainable amount to be caught. An impossible task. It's much too complex for that. And again, that's our plea for area management to create smaller regions where management can be more effective. Um, and catch as you could go on indefinitely, especially if you don't know as much about it as you should. Just that 
it's privatized access. I think we have a question over here, and then I'm seeing some over here as well. So we'll start with over there. Sure. Uh, I guess my question is primarily for John. I'm going to try and open it up at the end. But um, Maine is a fairly unique citizen initiative process that allows it to be rather accessible for ballot questions as we see this fall. And I guess some can view that as sort of pinnacle democracy, reaching the masses, but it could also be viewed as a sort of subversion of the representative democracy. So I guess my question is, have you seen or do you um, anticipate that this could be used as a venue or could be seen as a problem for a sustainable food systems um, progress? And I guess to open that up in a more broader sense, what sort of electoral, in the world of like electoral systems, how do we reach that Jeffersonian ideal of the farmers having a say in the process and what, what has to be done to make that happen? Wow, good, good questions. We could, we could have a conference around that. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Maine, we, we do have a, a, a process that allows uh, citizen-initiated bills, pieces of legislation, and the flip side, we also have something called the People's Veto, where anything that gets passed by the legislature, uh, then 10% of the population on providing signatures on that can ask for it to be placed on the ballot to have it potentially withdrawn. Uh, I think in concept, both of those things are good and they sort of suggest the idea of democracy. Uh, however, if you look at the history of how they've been used in the last 10 years, they are almost always um, uh, uh, examples of where, uh, uh, how do I say this without being too political, uh, the party that didn't get their way to try to uh, put something um, forward and uh, so I think it's, they, they have really been tools that have been uh, misused, uh, but they are tools that can be used also for some good. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, Opportunity Maine, which was a fairly creative idea to help uh, uh, Mainers pay for college education in return for having them stay in the state and, and work, was put forward as a, uh, a people's initiative it never went out to the voters because one option that the legislature has is to adopt something like that when it comes in. If that had been submitted as a bill, it would not have passed. Because it came in as a bill, I should say if it was submitted in the normal process by a legislator, John Piotti would have sponsored it. It wouldn't have passed. But because it went through this um, signature gathering process, and a real PR campaign, it was very well organized, um, the legislature, when it got there, said, oh, this is a good idea. And we're often followers, not leaders. And I think there may be some opportunities like that in, in the food area. Um, so yes, it's a tool that exists. And we could spend all day saying whether or not citizen-initiated bills is a good tool or a bad tool. I guess what I'll tell you is it's a tool that exists Use every tool you can to advance an agenda that makes sense. Back here. Can you speak to the environmental and economic impact of local fish farming or aquaculture? Yeah. Uh, my. Uh, uh, when I first came ashore, I had a water quality environmental lab in Stonington. And I used to do DEP and EPA monitoring for salmon farms. And for fish farming, uh, I have to say, uh, the very best places to grow fish, such as salmon, were nursery grounds for herring and uh, juvenile ground fish. So I've ended up being not comfortable with growing fin fish in salt water for that reason. Uh, that said, uh, there's a serious effort to aquaculture uh, mussels and uh, suspended culture of mussels and uh, soft and hard shell clams and oysters. And that's m much less intrusive, properly done. That's a good alternative. 
and a good source of high quality seafood. Um, I'm not terribly comfortable with that either, but the truth is, is that plays a very credible role in food supply and this, I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all. Uh, I just like this, uh, this very complex natural system that we have. The interactions that exist uh, produce a whole suite of different species that we can harvest and use if we use it right. But I guess shellfish, yeah, that's pretty good. Fin fish, more complicated. Better done ashore. I think we have room for about three more questions. And I'd like to see if upstairs, I can't quite see you guys. I think I see a hand right there. Go for it. The question is, can, uh, direct it to Ted again, I think, uh, is um, can lobster be considered a sustainable fishery present. at present? Yeah. Uh, I look at it and say, by golly, yes, my uncle was right. <laughs> uh, we've protected all the life stage bottlenecks of the lobster. We've protected reproduction. We've protected juvenile stages. Uh, we've protected uh, the habitat by limiting the fishery to traps only. Uh, we've controlled the fishery by limiting the number of traps any individual can fish. We've limited the mobility of the fishery without throttling it. Uh, fishermen can. Uh, fish offshore if they have a federal permit. Uh, fishermen can go uh, east or west into one other uh, of the lobster zones as long as it's less than half of their gear present there. You sum all of these things together and you have what I feel is the ideal management program for our coastal shelf, all of our coastal shelf fisheries including ground fish. Uh, that's the only place these species reproduce. It's the only place these species uh, uh, spend their juvenile stages. So it would be win-win in the long term to do that. Uh, for lobsters, uh, I think they're going to keep doing fine. Our problem in lobsters is that we have too good a management plan. And as a result, we've plugged up our market. And we need to work on how to, to manage that part of it. But the fishery itself is healthy. Thanks, Ted. Um, I just got word that we're running a little bit behind schedule. So I'm going to take one more question. And then I'm going to ask Heather to come up and make a few announcements. So let's do one last question uh, right here in the front. What is my suggestion for getting all the good information on organic agriculture into the uh, mainstream? I think the people who are publishing it uh, are working very hard to get into the mainstream. But I think the, the counter propaganda from the people who uh, uh, are uh, in love with the status quo is uh, far more powerful and, and more numerous, and it makes it difficult for the good things to be heard among the din. Great. Thanks to all four of you.
Um, thanks for some great questions. I know that there were many of you who still had some questions, um, but I think these folks are going to be around for a while and are here to interact. Um, so feel free to track them down uh, during break.